taking another crack at the privilege thing. Um, this may turn into a bit of a ramble because it's so so vast a topic. Uh, Kentucky said so as well that you can make a hundred videos on this, and it's very difficult to actually get to the bottom of it. But um, here goes. Apologize in advance if it is a ramble. I've been I'm kind of rusty when it comes to making videos here, so. Um, I watched Phoenix's video, uh, response to my video, and first of all, there's something of a mea culpa here. Um, when I uploaded my original videos of India to YouTube a few days ago, or a week ago, or whenever I did it, I did so kind of half-heartedly, sort of, oh, I might as well put these, you know, in here. For whatever they're worth. Not much really, I don't think. They're they're not the most thoughtful videos I've ever made. Um, and I didn't really take the responses all that seriously. It wasn't that I didn't take the people making the responses seriously, it's just my head wasn't in full-on YouTube mode. Um, so I was a bit offhand, and for that I guess I apologize. I, I didn't mean to be, and it's, as people who know me know, it's not really my style to be like this. Uh, maybe it is my style as a person, but not as this talking head that I've created for YouTube. I try to, my my YouTube persona, I try to have as a diplomatic, uh, uh, diplomatic alter ego, I guess. In real life, I'm quite a hothead. Um, but <clears throat> hot-headed and also rather cold-hearted, I'll be honest. Um... So, you know, when I, when I look at the comments that were on there, I didn't really think through a lot of the responses, and I just sort of one-liners or whatever, you know, just rolled my eyes and said, I, I really couldn't be bothered to do this justice. But, well, you know, it, it's, it wasn't that I didn't care about the people who left the responses. It's just that I, that wasn't where my head was. And people who took the time to respond to me, I guess, in all honesty, I should have taken the time to think about what I was going to say and think about how it could be mis misconstrued or whatever. So, you know, there's a mea culpa for you. Um, but to return to the actual subject matter of privilege, Phoenix says that it's context dependent or context driven or whatever, and I would agree with that because in a sense, everybody is privileged and everybody is underprivileged. It, it's all a question of you know, where do you draw the, the line? Where, where is your benchmark? Where's the, um, because again, privilege versus underprivilege is all relative, right? It, you know, in, I was dealing with white privilege. Um, and I'll admit to something else here. It was a bit of a hucksterish title. Um, it was kind of, white, white privilege is one that actually fascinates me. And I think that that's what I'd, I'd like to have dealt with uh, was that one. Um, but my video didn't really deal in white privilege a great deal. So anyway, um, so we're all privileged to one degree or another. As you know, I don't know if Oprah Win Winfrey has ever used the term white privilege, but she's a I don't know a billionaire, I think. And it's pretty hard to sort of not see her as a highly privileged individual uh, who was you know able to talk with presidents or whatever, you know, run for president possibly on the strength of a TV show, um, but she's also African American, so by some sort of logic, I, I have a privilege that she doesn't have because if we sort of think of how much of an uphill struggle she had to um, get where she is today, uh, the fact that she is an African American made that struggle that much harder, possibly. Um, so if we want to sort of really limit um, the discussion. And again, it's context dependent. If we want to control the context, um, then in many ways, if you ask me, it's a gerrymander. Because you're saying only within these narrow confines will I actually agree to discuss privilege. Um, not privilege in general. Because I have no problem, even though I don't really agree with the whole idea of intelligence, but Oprah has more of what is necessary to become a gazillionaire than I do, uh, deep down in her character. She was born with this. I wasn't. So she's kind of privileged in a way, and I think most people would agree to that. Um, but again, 
if we're going to talk about privilege, and the original one was privilege of wealth uh, disparities, that is a gerrymander because we're not really taking into consideration what, or we're not taking into consideration all the multifarious permutations on privilege in general. Um, there's a fascinating scene in the series Rome where uh, the actor playing Pompey Magnus, Pompey the Great, one of the two most powerful people in, the, in Rome and thus in the world, is talking to a slave. And Pompey at the time is struggling for his political survival. And he has hundreds of thousands of people depending on what he does. In ancient Rome, when you were at the top of the heap, you had thousands and thousands and thousands of people who had, as it were, hitch their cart to your horse, and you were, as the leader of these people, responsible for their well-being. That was the patron-client system that underpinned Rome. So not only was Pompey concerned about his own political survival, he was also heavily burdened by the knowledge that all of his people are watching, and if he fails, they all suffer, which is exactly what happened when Caesar won the Civil War, of course. So he says to the slave, how nice it must be to be a slave or something like this. You never have to express your will at all. You never have to uh, worry about anything. You never have to uh, make harsh decisions. You never have to be accountable the way I do. Now that's, okay, let's be honest. Anyone who knows what slavery really is, Pompey doesn't really have anything to complain about. Uh, slavery is, in the ancients agreed, slavery was like fate, fate worse than death. It was the worst thing that could happen to somebody. When you turn somebody into a slave, you have to destroy them internally while keeping their body intact. Buck breaking, just look that one up. Um, it's what took place in the southern U.S. and the West Indies when a new um, particularly difficult young male slave was uh, brought uh, brought to the uh, to the plantation or wherever, and the overseers had to break that person, that young man. Buck breaking was male gang raping. Uh, you have to completely destroy that person, their self respect, their sense of self. You have to do all of that, and this just begins to scratch the surface of, surface of what slavery really was. So it's kind of absurd for Pompey to say. And, and this is certainly what slavery was in the, in the ancient world. Uh, it's kind of absurd for Pompey to say, well, well, how I envy you. Must be nice to be a slave, eh? But there is a grain of sense in what he's saying. Um, when you study things like high Stalinism in Russia, a lot of Russians have very fond memories of the Stalin era. Yeah, they do. <laughs> um, 20 million dead at Stalin's whim, and they still think that, in some sense, those were the good old days. Why? You didn't have to think. All you had to do was follow orders. You had to interpret and carry out orders from whoever the boss was in your local area, and that person had the job to interpret and carry out directives that began, in many cases, all the way in the Kremlin in Stalin's mind. You didn't have to take any initiative. In fact, initiative was dangerous, so you kept your head down. You just obeyed. Um, you, you replaced all of life's little fears, little anxieties, with one big fear. The fear of slipping up. The fear of incurring Stalin's wrath. But that simplified life. It turned life into a very simple equation. Uh, Life under Stalin wasn't necessarily slavery, but was definitely what something what I would call, I guess, peonhood or something like that, where you're completely dependent on the whim of one person or a group of people, I suppose. And that is the lack of accountability that is the one privilege that the slave will cling to no matter what. Um, it's not my fault. It's that person's fault. I'm just following orders. I'm just doing as I'm told, and if I don't do as I'm told, I'm going to be you know, punished for it by my master, killed, whatever. 
And in a sense that, you know, unless you're an out-and-out -out slave, it kind of, um, it can actually lessen the burden of servitude. Um, all you have to do is the bare minimum to stay out of trouble and beyond that, your life and your mind are your own. Whereas the people at the top have to constantly be thinking, constantly be, you know, considering all possible eventualities and everything. And that's the sort of trap of freedom, I suppose. If you're free, suddenly everything is your responsibility and you can't slough anything off onto anyone else, which is why, you know, sometimes people, you know, we, we call these people sheeple, will actually hand power over to people that are more powerful than them. Because there is something to be said in living in a life where you're not accountable. Um, you don't have to think. You don't have to worry about anything. Uh, especially if you have a more or less benign dictator. Now, there's not many of those out there, but, you know, some people might just say, oh, I have a good boss who doesn't bother me, so I just keep below the radar and let him call the shots. That That is kind of a slavish outlook, right? Uh, you're abdicating some of your autonomy to somebody else to control your life. Um, you know, slavish, say, to go to church and have reality handed to you by somebody else every Sunday instead of thinking of, thinking it out yourself. Um, so there is a certain draw to that. Now, the person who has the power has certain disadvantages incumbent upon that, i.e. heavy responsibility or the burden of, of authority or whatever. The original series of Star Trek did a very good job of dealing with that, with Captain Kirk's character. He was, he was an egomaniac who liked having power, but in his private moments he would sort of say, my God, this is a heavy burden, this command that I've, that I've got. Even though I like it, it's, it's, oftentimes it's hard on the mind and hard on the heart. Um, now, that, I would say, is a species of privilege, the privilege of not having to run your own life, to allow somebody else to run it for you. You're being, you're, you're, you're seeing the leaders of society in the way that a child would see a parent. It's your job to look after me and provide everything for me, and I don't owe you a great deal other than my obedience. Um, that's seductive, isn't it? for some people. Um, so, in a sense, the person who is underprivileged has hidden privileges that are only apparent if he or she is deprived of them. Um, the, where, where it becomes difficult is when we get the idea of oppression and victimhood and perphood or whatever. It complicates everything. Um, because, again, the assumption is Privilege is something that we don't want people to have, but we know that it's inevitable. Um, so, who gets to decide what privilege is more valid than another privilege? See, that I would argue that person is the person with the power. The person with the power to judge. The person with the power to set the goalposts. We're talking about context. Okay, who gets to set the context? And who gets to, I would say, maintain the context? Um, because a lot of people suspect that the argument will go thus. First of all, I just want to point out at, at the beginning, let's say somebody is trying to define what privilege is. I just want to point out something that everyone, I think, will agree with. White people are privileged or able to people are privileged or certain rich people are privileged in a certain way under certain contexts. And this is what I want to talk about. But as the discussion develops, that subtly sort of recedes, and it's not as though anyone is deliberately sweeping anything under the carpet. It's just constant usage sort of makes one forget that the goalposts have been set and that someone has set them. So what was originally just a very context dependent statement and say just for the sake of argument white privilege or western privilege or whatever you want to use um eventually becomes sort of you know an unchallenged fact i guess 
And the fact that people might agree with it under the, the original context kind of gets lost. Then later on, you get, like, in, in the discussion, you get, okay, we've already established that a position of privilege exists. Now, where do we build from there? And again, I mentioned Gramsci, which is the, the, the name that everyone who bandies around terms like cultural Marxism loves to use. Um, he was the guy who came up, I guess, with cultural Marxism or was a main contributor to the Frankfurt School or whatever. Um, and, you know, his theory was whoever can create the reality, whoever can create the context is in control of society. Now, I don't really agree to that in that I don't believe that what we believe as a society is a conspiracy. And I don't believe that ideas like white privilege are a conspiracy either. Um, the people that are always railing about cultural Marxism definitely do say that it's a conspiracy. But it's just when you don't go back and revisit your premises, something can happen over time to, to ideas, to words. And you forget the axioms upon which the original premise was based. So you can go from a position of, of say, stating the obvious, say, wealth is privilege, to going to moving towards absolute um, assertion or assumption that wealth is privilege. And you might not even notice when that has actually occurred. Now I'm talking psychology here, and that's difficult to discuss when, when you're when you're discussing things like this. But since what we're talking about is the relative or the relationships between people, and that's what privilege is. It's a relationship between people. We are talking about psychology here. How do I see this person? Is this person privileged to me or are they, un are they underprivileged to me? Um, and you can forget the fact that it is context driven and, and that it is kind of a psychological game, a mind game of many, in many ways. You're trying to set the stage for a further discussion. Now, this is why I dug my heels in very soon on a statement that I took exception to. White people visit the tropics in order to exploit poverty, period, or something like that. I said, is that the only reason why people go to the tropics? Or I, I, I don't want to misquote anybody. Westerners, I guess. Um, okay, you can say that, that we, 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 let's, let's assume that we are doing that, okay? Let's say that I'm going to India because it is cheap, and it is very cheap. Uh, to tool around India. I'm going there because it's cheap and I'm going to eat in cheap restaurants and I'm going to bargain like hell to get what I want from people and this sort of thing. And um, you know, I'm sure a lot of that does take place. A lot of people go to places like Thailand and Indonesia for that because these places are cheap. Uh, you go there to exploit the local inhabitants. I'm, I'll never be the one to say that that doesn't happen. But it doesn't mean that everyone is that who is there is exploiting people. And not only that, it doesn't mean that the people whom one is exploiting are not themselves exploiting. Because anyone that I would have any dealings with in India would not be what is, by Indian standards, poor people. The guy who owns the small guest house that I'm staying at, who owns the dingy little restaurant that I'm taking my meals at, um, the guy who's selling me whatever trinkets and souvenirs I'm purchasing from. This is not one of India's poor. This is either the upper working class or the lower middle class. And there's a very good chance, just because of the structure of Indian society, that this individual, who I may be exploiting, is also him or herself an exploiter. Um, that's the reality of India, isn't it? The guy who is, say, selling cheap mass-produced souvenirs outside of a temple that I visited, and I want to buy, I don't know, a little uh, postcard or something like this to mail back to relatives. He might be buying the postcards from a horrific sweatshop, churning these things out on people that are barely given enough to eat. Uh, or enough pay to keep them alive. 
Now, who's exploiting who here? He's, he's the middleman here, and I'm buying off him. Am I exploiting him? Am I also exploiting the people further down the food chain, the people producing the postcards? Or is he exploiting them? Because he's trying to get me to buy his wares at as much of a markup as he can get from me. So he will buy from whoever drives their workers hardest to get the lowest cost for the product that he's buying. Who is responsible for this? is the implication. Well, you're the richest person, so you're the one who's ultimately responsible because it's your money that is driving all of this. Possibly, but if you take that kind of an approach, you understand what you're doing uh, to everything. Um, go down to the store and buy something. Where was it made? Under what conditions? Under what circumstances? Um, especially an item of clothing. It's very hard to buy clothing that's not from what we still call the third world these days. Um, just just a t-shirt. Made in China, it says. Okay, we all know what Chinese sweatshops are like. Just try and buy something, though, that isn't made in China. What's the difference? Everybody now is an exploiter, right? If you buy anything from anybody, you're an exploiter. So, again, because of this context thing, and who is in control of the context... Um, it distorts the overall picture. Privilege, I would say you're either privileged or you aren't. You're either absolutely privileged or you are not. You are absolutely underprivileged or you are not. How do we determine this? And more importantly, who gets to determine it? I'm not sure that anybody can be trusted to be, I don't know, ethically neutral enough to pinpoint where exploitation is taking place and who is responsible ultimately for all of it. Um, and whether or not exploitation is even taking place. Um, as I said, I went to Calcutta. Now. In Calcutta, it's one of the last places on earth where you can get uh, a rickshaw driver, a rickshaw ride from somebody holding onto it and running with his feet in front of you, you know, in the rickshaw. You can often get these old men to do that. I didn't do it. Um, but, you know, it's it's this... I, I, I didn't do it, I guess, for moral reasons. Plus, I have the typical kind of working class snob attitude that I don't want people doing that. This, that that's just ridiculous. That's just um, completely frivolous to have somebody bowing and scraping before me and pulling me around in a, in a rickshaw. I can, I got my own perfectly good legs. I'm going to walk wherever I'm going to go. Or I'll pay a taxi driver to take me there or something. But of course, what I'm doing is in in another sense, I'm depriving 100,000 families of an income, right? This is the only income that they have the potential to, the, the only income that they can generate is the male members of their family go out and pull rickshaws around the city for a pittance. Now, they don't have that because I'm taking a moral stand. Have I deprived these people by not using the service that they provide? Indian thinking, especially the thinking of the caste uh, system, uh, is that, no, no, you need to avail yourself of these, the services provided by the lower orders, because without it, they have no place in our economy. Now, you can say, oh, that's all very well, because implicit in that is the, the assumption that, you know, um, the rich should be the ones to generate and distribute all the wealth, right? Instead of everyone in society having the same crack at wealth. Um, you're not being an altruist by having an army of servants, right? But, you know, if you fire all your servants, you're not doing them any favor either, right? So it all depends on who's in charge of the goalposts, who's in charge of setting the context, who's in charge of setting the original rules. And I think there is something of a fight going on in the global discourse, as it were, 
about exploitation, about privilege, about uh, relative advantage and who is exploiting whom. And the digger, the deeper you dig and the farther down you go into the rabbit hole, you realize that exploitation goes all the way to the top and all the way down to the bottom. Somebody's always getting the best of somebody else. And, or some being is always getting the best of some other being. Now, you can either take the, the view that, okay, well, that, what that means is that existence itself is rotten, so let's call the whole thing off. Or you can just say exploitation is a fact of life. You, you can't walk around thinking that you're going to end exploitation, even if you would like to limit it, if it's at all possible. Why would you want to limit exploitation? Well, I'll tell you why. I'm certainly not out of guilt. I, I, I'm not going to... Um, I feel no guilt at all in visiting India, I'll tell you that. Um, what, what I would say is the best way to eliminate exploitation is to genuinely care about people who may or may not be being exploited. Um, and genuinely care about the exploiters, even. Oh, why should we care about those horrible exploiters? Ah, there's those goalposts again, right? Because exploit exploitation is taking place. Now we've got people who are labeled as exploiters, right? That, that wasn't the original intent of this privilege thing, right? But you, you, know, you can get to that point if you're not careful. You might not even notice that it's happening. Why would you want to avoid exploiting somebody? Well, maybe you like that person and you don't want that person to have exploitation visited upon them, or at least unacceptable exploitation. Because again, that person is probably an exploiter as well. Why do I think that love or kindness or whatever it should be the deciding factor? Well, I'll tell you this. I'll, I'll go out on a limb and I'll say something. It's late in the video, so I don't know if anyone will get this far. Um, but I will go out on a limb and say, I believe this, and I'm convinced of it, and I'm prepared to debate this with anybody. The Indian people like it when foreigners visit their country. They like foreigners. Now, I would also say that the foreigners who visit India generally have an affectionate view of the Indian people, generally speaking. I would say, I would even go so far as to say under the British Raj, when the British literally exploited India. They used it as a money factory. Um, there were plenty of British people who might have thought that the Indians were backward and silly and incapable of running their own affairs, but, you know, even when you read poetry like Rudyard Kipling, there's an underlying affection for the Indians. And, and again, on a certain level, like say a poem like Gunga Din, where he shows the racism of the British soldiers and the way they kicked Gunga Din around. But at the last line of the poem is, of course, though I've whipped you and I've flayed you by the living God that made you, you're a better man than I am, Gunga Din. What is that? That's affection, right? Even if he did actually kick Gunga Din in the butt all the time, um, while he was a bisti, a, a water bearer for the for the army, um, part of him knew that I'm not really superior to this person. This guy's very admirable. It's not so much that he's loyal to the British Raj, but he's doing his job under near impossible circumstances. There's a firefight going on. We're all shooting at each other, and this guy's risking his life to give me a drink of water. Wow, you know you've got to admire that, right? You, you've, you've got to almost feel a sense of gratitude and love for this person for having done this. Um, they were gone without water for a long time in India. You'll know how that feels when some loyal person crawls over broken glass for several miles to give you a drink of water. You, you can't help but feel gratitude for that. As a general rule, the Indian people want tourists in their country. And as a general rule, the tourists that go there respect the Indian people and like them. You have 
I, I, you know, over the course of the three weeks that I was there, I can't tell you the number of encounters I had with Indians that were absolutely delightful. Here we are, two people who are completely different from completely different head spaces. And we're looking across this vast cultural, psychological, mental, emotional, intellectual gulf. And we like what we see. Uh, you see the big ear-to-ear -ear grin on the Indian who's tickled pink just to have a chance to talk to a foreigner. And this, of course, makes you like that person. And, you know, you... you you don't want to exploit that person, not because it's not a matter of principle or guilt or anything. You just like him or her. You you want to give that person a, a fair shake. Uh, my glasses uh, fell apart at one point when I was in India, and I went from shop to shop to shop to try and get them fixed, and I was having a hard time of it, and I finally ended up in a, in a jeweler's shop who fixed my glasses. Now, I was prepared to pay. Uh, for this, but the, the guy, the, the the fellow who owned the shop, and this this was a fairly well-off Indian. Uh, you know, he had a jewelry shop, so he's got money. Uh, he just refused payment. Why? Because he had dignity. He's he was thinking, I, this guy doesn't know me anything. It's nothing for me to fix these. Uh, you know, why don't I just be nice and just let him have it? And by the same token, I felt gratitude towards him and I wanted to pay him and it wasn't a, it wasn't a burden or a matter of pride I wanted no 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 you've taken the time to do this I would love to recompense you for this I don't want to just get something from you for nothing but he didn't want the money uh, there, there's so many situations like this you wouldn't think so in a tourist ridden country like India India but there are um the Indian sense of dignity and propriety is legendary. There are things that you just can't get an Indian to do under any circumstances, even if his life depends on it. And again, they have kind of an honor-based ethics system, and you know his honor was at stake, and he just said, no, no, I, I just wanted to do you a favor, and that's that. Isn't that the best way to interact with people who are kind of not at your level? It's not that I, I you know, I'm not going to go into this jeweler's shop and walk out going, ha, 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 right? you know, built him out of 50 rupees or whatever because he gave it to me for nothing. It's like, oh, wasn't that nice? Wasn't that nice of the guy? What a, what a splendid fellow. And by the same token, he has, he feels good because he's done a, a favor to a somewhat befuddled and slightly desperate tourist who needs his glasses and can't see. He feels good about this. Um... You would think that if you, if I was in a situation of absolute privilege over him, why the hell should he feel sorry for me? Well, I was a guy without glasses. Wouldn't anybody feel sorry for that? You're walking around in the world as a blur. Um, there are options. There are alternatives besides exploitation. Uh, there are interpersonal relationships besides those based on privilege. And again, he who controls those goalposts, or she, basically controls everything about the debate from there on in. Sorry this went on so long, but it's a huge subject and uh, one that cries out for clarification.